Hey everybody, it's Adam Brush from IHP and we're back with uh, JC Unplugged and we are now up to episode 7. We have a lot of great questions, so like always we're just going to get right into it. Um, Carl's first question, believe it or not, comes from Romania. So it's one of your Facebook followers. Um, so what is your opinion about ballistic, I'm just going to read it as they wrote it. So, okay. What is your opinion about ballistic weight training for tennis players and swimmers, for an example, the clean and jerk and other variations like that. And if you are to use it, how do you make the conversion to tennis and swimming? If ballistic, I'm assuming, since he gave the example, I'm assuming that ballistic would be Olympic weightlifting or Olympic weightlifting um, genre, which we're looking basically at high pulls, um, snatch and clean jerk, uh, cleans from the floors, uh, push jerks, cleans, and snatches, those are the only thing I can think of because they're going to be doing transfer partial lifts, you know? So, <clears throat> my whole thing is I'm not a big fan of Olympic weightlifting for, for sports like tennis. Again, is it, could it be part of a general conditioning or general strength? Yeah, but I think we're wasting time. It, it, it's too much to learn, too high a skill, too much risk for all symmetrical training, bilaterally loaded, symmetrically loaded, all up and down. And tennis is a game of uh, single leg transfers and, and rotation. So personally, I don't like it. Um, would I do some deadlifts and stuff like that early on? Maybe. Can I think of something better? Absolutely. You know, I wouldn't even mind doing leg presses or just a squat or, or, or even maybe a deadlift with, with them. But I wouldn't be doing that for, for too long. I would much rather do uh, um, a slap or a car push for strengthening. You know, or a Kaiser runner for strengthening. And not even deal with, with vertically loading them by that. Your thoughts are the same thing for swimmers too? Same thing for swimmers. I mean, can traditional strength training exercises be part of the general strength program? Yes, they can. So, you know, for example, if I'm if I'm gonna do a triplex, can this be a barbell squat? You know, and, and if you're dealing with the Europeans that have a huge background, can that be a high pull? Okay, I'll give you that. And then over here I would I go T push up, and then over here I would do a band rotation. Like that. So you know, as as you do three or four sets of this, this would be eight to fifteen reps if you're in a hypertrophy, or four to six if you're in a strength mode. These are ten to twelve. I mean, ten to twenty, and you're done. This is the way I would train just about everybody. General strength and conditioning, fine. Keep them there four weeks. Then what? Then you got to start moving them to more single leg stuff and, and, and more applicable change of motion, change of direction. Okay. Got it. All right. All right, this is a good one. Um, could you explain to an entrepreneur who's looking to start up their own gym what the hardest part of running a gym is? The hardest part of running a gym is managing people. Simple. Managing people. A lot of people start a gym because they like exercise and, and just like they start a restaurant. Oh, I like to cook. I like to entertain. Restaurant is a natural for me now. Running a restaurant and cooking and entertaining family are two different things, okay? The hardest thing about managing a restaurant is managing personnel, managing pay, uh, perishables, how to order food, creating a menu. It, it's, it's more than just, let's cook. You know, this is the same thing in the gym. Everybody wants to, uh, you like to exercise, let's, let's own a, a gym. When you own a gym, you have to manage people. You have to make sure that people charge for their services that they're not in the red, that they show up on time, that they don't cancel appointments, and inevitably, somebody's gonna not have an alarm, the alarm is gonna break, the alarm didn't go off, and all of a sudden you have a pissed off client. So how do you manage that person? How do you inspire and instill in that person a sense of professionalism, a sense of caring without you having to be on? That's the hardest part about running a gym, not to mention keeping the lights on, because if there's a hurricane, if there's a flood, if there's a blackout, Bank doesn't care. You're still paying. So you have to manage your funds and manage people. By far, the hardest thing about man managing any business is managing personal Plus, you got a lot of keys in the kitchen, too. <sighs> Three of them. <laughs> Car, home, IHP, done. All right. Um, what about uh, caffeine? Can caffeine have an effect on performance? Caffeine is probably the best and most studied ergogenic aid <clears throat> on the planet, hands down, period, done deal. Caffeine, not necessarily coffee, caffeine 
has been associated, not has been associated, has been shown to improve everything from memory, IQ, uh, 100, yard meet, uh, uh, 100 yard dash or 100 meter dash, 1RMs, you name it, and caffeine has been able to, to improve it, shown predictably. Plus, uh, it's a great microlytic agent, so it'll release fat from the, body, from, the, from the tissues and get it into the bloodstream. You know, the downside is that you can become a little bit of used to it, so you eventually need a little bit more. Right. But just, just a side note, I read about uh, caffeine dilating your eyes a little bit and improving vision, which could be huge for it, it's it's amazing. Wow. Response time, everything, everything. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a multi-part question here. Um, what muscles are the prime movers in the hanging leg slash knee lift? The hanging yeah. leg? Yeah, that we do with the harness. I would say, generally speaking, the hip flexors. You know, the, the abdominals, the <coughs> abdominals are going to hold this, but sooner or later, here's your hip and here's your leg. These guys here that cross this joint are the ones that are in charge. Okay, who crosses that joint? Rectus femoris, iliosaurus are the big guns. You know, now you have your abdominals that come below this section here and, and uh, uh, attached through fascia and whatnot to the ischial tuberosity. So those guys here are maybe in charge of tilting this a little bit. So your abs are definitely going to work, okay? But the big guns in actual movement are the hip flexors. Okay. Follow-up, the two follow-up questions to that is, then what is the benefit of having someone do that exercise and is, is it worth it? What's the reward? Um, especially when we see a lot of uh, clientele where they're hanging and they're kind of getting into this bad shoulder posture. Right. So what's the re the risk to reward? Um, the risk is that you have to be you have to have a strong lat and shoulder stability because if not you're like this and you can you know get your get your shoulders all beat up. Okay. That's the that's the risk. Uh, the benefit is that that area also if you do it correctly gets enormously strong. You know. Uh, also your abdominals get strong. So for kicking, uh, for combat, for a host of things, I think it's just a great general, general exercise. You just have to know what you're doing and, and make sure that you have these, uh, a strong enough core so when the iliosaurus and, and, uh, pull on the lumbar spine, you don't get hyper extension of the lumbar spine. So if you get enough stiffness when the legs are pulled against this huge mass through the spine, everything is cool. That's the same thing with the leg raises and it's the same thing with the sitting, except in reverse. Okay, um, when cutting weight for a fight, is it true you should stop eating, drinking past a certain time in the evening? No, I think, I actually, there's a big debate when you should stop eating and what the constituents of the last meal should be. Um, suffice it to say that if you're going to reduce fat, glucose management and health, glucose management is number one. Regulate your sugar. So that's why the, the, the most sound thing is, you know, uh, keep your fruits in the morning, okay? Uh, get your vegetables and your meats in, in the evening and your starches in the day, something like that. So get your higher natural sugar in, in, the, uh, in the early part. And then your vegetables, which are lower glycemic and your protein later on. Assuming that you're waking up at six o'clock, don't eat after eight, nine o'clock. So don't get into night eating syndrome, which is you're eating at 11 o'clock, and that's all, we, if you're hungry at 11 or 12, it's because your, your, your insulin is out of whack, okay, and you're hungry, not to mention emotional stuff, we'll, we'll go away from that, but that's, I would say, if you're waking up at 6, you know, I would say don't eat after 8 or 9 o'clock, all right, try to make low glycemic your last meal, vegetables, uh, salads, and, and meats, if you're cutting weight, you should be eating like that, all the time. Have your pasta and your stuff in the middle of the day to replenish your, your, your glycogen stores after after time and make sure that you're doing nutrient timing because if you train really hard and deplete your, yourself of glycogen and you wait 24 hours, if you don't do it in the first two hours, you're going to need 24 hours to restore glycogen and if you're doing two a day, you're going to be empty tank all the time. That's the reason you do nutrient timing. Right after a big wrestling workout, right after a big, big weight training workout, you pump some glucose, you pump some protein, immediately gets right into the muscle, hopefully within the first half hour, and boom, you're in. Then you can go to the next training session with a full tank. Otherwise, you're dead. Right? So I would only stop eating about 
24 hours out, you eat what we call, you eat by weight. Okay, so 36 hours out, you really stop with your, with your water. You over pump the water about two gallons a day until 36 hours, and then you remove it all of a sudden. And if your body's used to urinating, all right, and excreting a pound and a half, that's over, you know, that's 12 and 14 pounds. So all of a sudden, you're going to the bathroom at, at 10 to 14 pounds rate. You take the water out, your body goes whoa, and by the time the kidneys find out that you're maybe need some water, it's waiting time. So food, I'd say 24 hour out, eat by weight, uh, reduce uh, water about 36 hours out. What are uh, the, some of the progressions you might teach to a client to do a single leg squat? Believe it or not, the, the way that I learned a single leg squat is you take uh, the easiest way. Of course, you're doing anterior reach, so you gotta get, get them balancing on a single leg. But this one here is, was very difficult. And the way I learned it was with a body master leg press. So you take a 45 degree leg press, single legged, rock it, before you know it, you can, you can drop into a pistol. So the easiest way for me, at the time, I didn't know it, I just did it by, by luck, was I used the leg press, single leg, to get me to do single leg uh, pistols, okay? The easiest way to do it is get them balanced. <coughs> the progression is anterior reaches, and then in here, just drop them little by little. You know, with a counterbalance, which is the one we don't do pistols anymore. So you just let that leg go back and just drop it a little bit at a time. Easy. So basically, you're keeping the same exercise, just increasing the range of motion with time. It takes about four weeks before somebody that's normal and fit can do a single leg squat. For the same. What about incorporating a, a, another exercise that can still help you with a single leg squat? For example, the lateral lunge. Lateral lunge. It's going to be, it won't be the best option here. Okay, it'll be, that's one of my favorite exercises, but not to teach the single leg squat. Single leg squat, anterior reaches, your pumps, and then load it up. You know, use an MVP shuttle, use a leg press, and just so you can sit there and get single leg strength, and then, and then go back to try to get there. It's easy, easy to learn. Okay, moving okay. along. When working with the general population, uh, what indicators are you using to help monitor the intensity of the workout? You know, basically, when are you judging that enough's enough for a particular client? Their face, their body language. You know, if they're if they if they're finished and they're going, let's go. You know, that's why we don't use heart rate. We don't use heart rate. Sometimes the heart rate is low for some reason. Sometimes it's high for some reason. <coughs> you know. Um, Person could be subclinical, a person who maybe didn't sleep right. So some people operate really high under heart, high heart rate. Some people have these drastically low heart rates and you're they're, you're crushing them and they're at 95. You're, what are you gonna go? Oh, your caller says 95. You're not giving me what you want. You see the guy like you know, uh, body body language. If they're bent over, they're breathing, you know they're honest with you, you know, slow down. If they're like, yeah, what are we doing next? Plow. That's it. It's, the, it's not that complicated for me. Uh, what's your go-to exercise? In other words, what exercise do you have to have in your in your workouts? Me personally or for my clients? Uh, well, let's find out a little bit about you, Carlos. What about you? <laughs> what about you? <laughs> what about you? <laughs> for me, biking. Biking. If, I, if I'm tight on the week, you say do something, I'll bike. Because I get out, I get away from everything. And today at 7 o'clock, it was beautiful. Boom. I got a new app. You know, I'm not a tech tech guy, you know. So I got a new app that shows all the way around average speed and your calories and all that. And I'm playing around with all that stuff. So like, if not, ten by ten by ten, okay? Ten seconds. I mean, ten reps, ten sets in ten minutes. You know, uh, Jared and I did a hands-on ball push-up, except that was 10 times 20 times 10. I don't think I made the 10-minute mark on that one, and I don't think I got a full 20 on the last three. But you know, it was hands-on ball push-ups, so like 20. We, we were across from each other, 20, 20, 20, 20. We were on target about minute seven, and then I started fading. You know, it's like 17, and then three, and then the next one was 13, two, one, and I did like five singles, and I was dead. But I like to train fast and get it out of the way and be done. So I'll, I'll go, you know, on a cable pro, uh, on a cable rope, and I'll sit there and nobody's 
touching the machine for 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'll stack it, and it's 10, rest, 10, rest, 10, rest, and I'll, I'll do that in 846. That one I'll do under 9 minutes. And done. Love it. What about general population? General population, anterior reach, my go to. Or reach and lunge. Money. Okay. Uh, well, a couple more here. Well, what are some of the uh, what are some exercises that a person with sciatic that can do to help alleviate some pain? Uh, cable deadlifts have been proven really, really. That, that's an up and coming one, especially with a kinesis or a band variable resistance, where you're like when you're here, okay, uh, the, the load is reduced. And the nice thing here is that you get traction, spinal traction. And then as you get stronger with the band or with the kinesis, you get more load. So that one there, we've been using a lot with sciatica. And boom, really good. The 45 degree bench is awesome as well. So those two are my go-to. If it's a bad sciatica, the person's really not in shape to be able to do these types of things, bridges, and then hypers or reverse hypers on a stability ball. So low level, bridges, and hypers and reverse hypers on a stability ball. Intermediate, we go um, 45 and, uh, and the cable deadlifts. And then advanced we're just the same thing, but loaded. Um, what are your uh, two favorite shoulder rehab or prehab exercises? I've had bad shoulders. And, and uh, I had a diagnosis this weekend uh, by one of the docs, and they think that I might have a, a, a slap tear on my left shoulder. I've had slap tears on, on my right pre-competition for Olympic weightlifting. And my last four weeks, all I did was high pulls. I couldn't make the transition over. Believe it or not, I rehab this. Believe it or not, and I don't recommend anybody do this, but this is the way I rehab the shoulder, is overhead presses on the machine. On the machine. And it, I used to ask Rio to come and help get, get it from here to there, because it's this transition that hurts me. But once I'm here, start with lockouts, and then little by little, come down, come down, come down, until I got full range of motion. So for me, the way it's, it's fixed, my shoulders get fixed is on overhead presses. Other than that, Y's, T's, and I's are the ways that you traditionally rehab a slap tear. So those are your, your you know, your go-to. I like the full movements here with, 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 a, with a band. I like those a little bit better with a moving scapula. So you have your options. Okay. All right, uh, one last question here. You know, you got some, um, you got a, a pretty cool time coming up here, I think, the next couple of months. You have a, a new book that you're really excited about. Yeah. Um, it's been taking you, I think, a couple years. Yeah, uh, the whole process has started in 2010. Yeah, with human kinetics. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your book. Talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, maybe we can find in the book that you're, that you're particularly pleased about. Functional Training, which is the working title, it's going to be the title of the book, and then it's going to have some kind of byline on it. i got to tell you, it's my best work. Without a doubt, I've got, uh, it'll be my 15th book. But I have the best, the updated best of the best from all my books there. So when we came up with the exercise menu, they just originally wanted 30 or 40 exercises. But you know, I, I like to I like to put out good stuff, a lot of good stuff. So I said, how are we going to make a book that's going to tackle all sports with 40 exercises? What do you want me to do? The same the same program over and over and over for different sports? That's not going to pan out. So. I organized the sports like I did with the Fit Moves DVD by the sports categories. So I had uh, high power field sports, I had court sports, I had throw, throw catch and, and hit sports like baseball, cricket, softball, all of those. I had um, uh, swimming sports, I had aerial sports. So the, I, I, I moved them into those categories and I also put our metabolic protocols, I put express programs. So the book's going to have like the best 100 exercises or so, and it's going to have a ton, a ton of programming available with our latest and greatest, with the octagon, with the uh, posterior anterior serrate, everything, everything updated. So it's going to be an awesome book. I can't wait until it comes out. It's going to be big. What, um, when's, when's the release date? Do you know yet? December 8th. That's what they're talking about. That that falls like on a Tuesday or something. I don't know. So probably might not be December eighth. We may have a signing here in Boca. I don't know, on the twelfth of December or something like that. You know. But it's going to be. We're going to have a signing here in Boca at the Barnes and Noble. That's my understanding. 
and that's going to be exciting because I'm going to have my entire Cuban family come up from uh, Miami, and that'll be about 50 crazy Cubans, and only five will buy a boat, but, <laughs> but they all, but they all will make a lot of noise. They're probably coming with it, but me, you know, with the pork. I'm going to have a barbecue in front of the in front of ones and normal here in Boca Raton. That's going to be a sight. They're going to dig a hole in the ground. Yeah, <laughs> and cement. Yeah. And so one last thing, um, everybody out there, September 26th, IHP is having a nutrition seminar here at IHP. Carlos uh, and uh, Joey Antonio are going to be talking from, what, 9 to 5 p.m. on Saturday, a lot, ton of nutrition information. Um, if you can't make it here but you want to attend remotely, contact Rio at IHPFit.com and he'll get you all set up for that. That concludes Episode 7. We'll see you guys in a couple weeks. All right.